When the U.S. pulled up stakes in Afghanistan this past August, the Biden administration didn't expect the Taliban to seize control of the country so quickly. 20 years of nation building and an Afghan military crumbled within days. To contain the Taliban's power, the international community acted quickly, freezing Afghan assets, shutting down foreign aid, and extending sanctions. Now, the country is facing mass starvation and economic collapse. We went to Afghanistan, reported from its provinces and capital, and had a rare conversation with a Taliban minister. We also met with humanitarian groups who've been left to pick up the pieces while negotiating with the Taliban. The story will continue in a moment. As our team arrived into the Kabul airport in Afghanistan, we weren't sure what we'd find. It was just four months ago that the world watched as scenes of unforgettable desperation and chaos played out here after the Taliban seized control. The lucky escaped. But for the 38 million Afghans that remain, the anguish continues. Right away, we saw their new reality. Armed Taliban forces are everywhere. We notice many of them have abandoned their traditional turbans, now wear the uniforms and gear that Western forces left behind. We see women and children dodging traffic to beg for cash, and men waiting in long lines for free food. I've been with WFP for a long time, 20 plus years. And I've never seen a crisis unfold and escalate at the pace and scale that we are seeing. Mary Ellen McGrorty is the director of the United Nations World Food Program in Afghanistan. From its warehouse in Kabul, she's overseen the delivery of over 117 tons of food to nearly 9 million Afghans since August. She explained to us why the country is now facing mass starvation. 72% of the population were already living below the poverty line before August, before the fall of the government. And now, what is the need like? Now it's just staggering. Uh, you know, we have 22.8 million people in what we call severe food insecurity. That's more than half the country right that now. That is more than half the country. People don't have jobs. They can't access cash. You know, food prices are going up. The currency is depreciating. So for us, we're now really in a race against time. Ravaged by war, drought, COVID, and the economic crash that followed the Taliban takeover, Afghanistan is on the verge of collapse. According to UNICEF, one million children in Afghanistan are now at risk of dying of starvation. Inside the children's hospital in Kabul, the beds were full and rooms quiet. This mother told us her five-month-old daughter was starving. She weighs just seven pounds. Doctors say all of the children in this room are suffering from malnutrition. They can't offer them medicine because they've run out. They can't offer them food because even the hospital doesn't have any. None of the staff here has been paid in four months. The hospital had been supported by international aid that was cut off when the Taliban took over. 30 years ago, the Taliban first rose to power, after a 10-year war with the Soviets and a collapse of the country's communist regime. Islamic extremists, they ruled with an iron fist, banishing women from the workplace, schools, and public life executing those who didn't follow their strict laws. Today, there are women on the streets, but not many. When the Taliban marched into Kabul, they urged women to stay home until they taught their fighters, quote, how to deal with them. Which makes what Mary Ellen McGorty is doing even more surprising. She's been personally negotiating with the Taliban so her drivers can deliver food to the needy. When you say you have to you know, reach out to the Taliban and talk to them, how does that work as a woman? Being a woman in Afghanistan at the moment is, yeah, uh, it's um, ch challenging. But I, I think they realize I'm the head of a UN organization, so they do have to meet with me, and that's the way it is. And for the, for the person sitting at home who says, well, how could they be engaging with the Taliban? They're an extremist group. How do you answer that? With humanitarian work, 
you know, the humanity comes first and being able to save lives come first. We remain impartial with a clear focus on, on, on the humanitarian imperative. McGuarty told us humanitarian groups have worked with the Taliban for much of the last decade. They had to, because even when there was a democratically elected government sitting in Kabul, the Taliban controlled 60 to 70 percent of the country. Manuel Fontaine, a director for UNICEF, first came to Afghanistan after 9-11. He explained how their relationship with the Taliban has evolved over the years. Has the Taliban said to you, we want you here, we need you here, help us? Yes, absolutely, from the beginning. And we've said from the beginning that we would be uncompromising when it comes to girls' education, or when it comes to uh, making sure that, um, that women can work. Since August 15th, have they been more or less receptive to what you have to say and what other NGOs have to say. They are receptive now in the sense that they realize that with power comes the responsibility to do something for the population of Afghanistan. They realize they have that responsibility and in that sense they're willing to have those discussions. Because of those discussions, UNICEF is now able to access communities previously off limits. We traveled with them and their government mandated Taliban escorts to one of those places. So we are in Mordak province, which is about two hours from Kabul. And the reason that this road is so bumpy is because there were so many IEDs here. This was a Taliban stronghold for about a decade. So groups like the UN would never have dreamed of coming out here. It was the first time UNICEF had been to this rural area in 12 years. What's the theory about how And the first time they were able to lay eyes on one of the results of their negotiations with the Taliban. <laughs> this community-based school for girls. Sturdy Mache? For how many of you girls is this your first year at school? Uh, Raise your hand. The child was at the last birthday. Okay. <gasps> wow. All of them. First the youngest girl here is six, the oldest 12. Many of them told us they hope to be doctors. The school, and 4,500 like them, operate with the Taliban's blessing. How did that happen? You know, this was a, a province that was controlled by the Taliban for a decade. How do you get to them and say, we want to have a school here? Talking to them, explaining the difference it makes. The discussions we're having with Taliban don't start from scratch. Um, that confidence that was built over the years in the, in the areas they controlled, you know, that trust is starting to build. What we saw in that school was heartwarming, but we know there are a million girls in high school who are not going to school. We know that there are no women being allowed really to attend college in any way. Are you making any grounds in, in that area? We are making some grounds, but not enough. That's obvious. What we hear from Taliban is they want to do that in a way that is keeping with the the culture that they, you know, the culture of the country. And so we need to find a way to do that. This country needs everybody's strength. Hello. After months of negotiations, we were granted access to meet Dr. Kalender Abad, the newly appointed health minister of the Taliban. A 41 year old physician, he was educated in Pakistan. He's missing with this food and. We were a little uneasy when he invited us to eat with him and other Taliban leaders in the basement of one of their buildings. He agreed to speak to us about the health crisis facing the country, but he told us he didn't want to discuss politics. Taliban gunmen kept watch over the interview. Some of the humanitarian workers we spoke to said that the country is on the verge of its worst humanitarian crisis ever. Do you believe that to be true? We are on the edge of this crisis. Everyone knows that, uh, that the funds are freezed by the international community. I think they can unfreeze the funds for the health sector of the Afghanistan. It is very important and it's the need of the time. The international community has spoken pretty clearly and said they're not gonna unfreeze funds unless there's a guarantee that all girls will be educated in Afghanistan. Is the Taliban willing to consider any kind of movement in that area? Uh, I think it's a uh, political issue. Education is a sep uh, separate chapter and a department, and health is a uh, different de uh, department. 
what I hear you saying is you want to keep health separate from the idea of education. Yeah, why they are mixing the two different topics? Well, because I think the idea that, you know, educating women is good for the health of the country. Uh, yes, there's no doubt. But the minister would not go further on concessions for girls' high school and university education. Nine days ago, the Taliban issued a decree banning both forced marriage and treating women as property. But there was no mention of allowing women to work outside the home. Soon after, the World Bank released $280 million in aid for Afghanistan, a small portion of the $1.5 billion frozen by the World Bank. Vicki Aiken has led the U.S.-based International Rescue Committee in Afghanistan for four years. Yeah, I, we need to figure out a system for continuing to support just basic services like education and health care. I mean, the previous government, 75 percent of their budget you know, was funded by development donors. 75 percent of the government budget yeah. was funded by donations. Yeah. And so health care, education have dried up. Yeah, and there's still no clear way forward. So Her staff of 1,200, mostly locals, interview families in the neediest neighborhoods. That's how they found Myra. 19 years old, she fled eastern Afghanistan three months ago with her two children. What kind of challenges have you faced? I faced a lot of problems. I couldn't support my children to buy something like food or clothes. The International Rescue Committee gave her about $400 to get blankets and food for winter. But they are fearful their funds could run out. If the aid wasn't here, what would that mean to your family if there wasn't this help? I wouldn't be able to support my family or children. I'm really thankful for them. What does $400 mean to a family in this moment? It means everything in this moment. I mean, we see a lot of cases where people might send their children off to work, including as young as five or six. You know, they might sell their daughters into marriage. And it's, I know it sounds horrendous, but when you have a family of, say, eight people, and you have no means to feed everyone, and they see that as their only option. Humanitarian leaders say without swift action, more people in Afghanistan could die of hunger next year than from the violence of the past 20 years of war. If you look at what the effect of sanctions have been, they're really hurting the people of Afghanistan more than they're hurting anyone in the Taliban. The Taliban have had sanctions on them for quite some time, and they've always managed to survive those sanctions. But now they have to run a government. I think a lot of people will say, well, I don't, we don't want to see aid go to Afghanistan because we don't want to give money to the Taliban that's an extremist group. So you want to make 38 million people suffer because of a few thousand? I, th that math doesn't work for me. How 60 Minutes traveled to Afghanistan to meet the Taliban. There you are face to face with people in your own country's uniforms that used to be the enemy. At 60MinutesOvertime.com.